Good evening. Hello. Hi. Oh, I don't need that. I have my own microphone. Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I'm the comedian, so what I'm going to say is really spiritually important. Can you hear me okay? It is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I am. Uh, my name is John Fugelsang. I apologize for everything I'm going to say. Um, it is such a thrill to, to an honor to be opening for Frank Schaefer <laughs> and to be opening for Reverend Jackie. I've opened for a lot of big talents in my life, but these two people are heroes of mine. They've both been multiple guests on my Series XM show. To me, they perform elegantly one of the greatest uh, superpowers that is so needed in our political and moral landscape in America, and that is they have the ability to thump Bible thumpers with the actual Bible. Um, by the way, you don't need to believe in the Bible as literal fact to do this. Atheists, I love my atheists, I believe in you. Uh, <laughs> atheists can use the Bible against fundamentalist hypocrisy just as well as believers, because we're about forming coalitions trying to help other people, and that's why it's kind of amazing to be doing this in a year where we learned um, that for the first time, U.S. membership at houses of worship has dipped below 50%. This year, for the first time, 47% of Americans say they go to a church, go to a synagogue, go to a mosque. And that's, that's not because God or Jesus screwed up. Um, you know, that's because of the hypocrisy of certain kinds of religious people. Amen. Certain kinds of men in funny hats and dresses. And, you know, they, they, they say the largest growing religious group in America right now are Mormons. Allow me to disagree. The largest growing religious group in America right now, I would argue, are people who were raised religious, but now consider themselves spiritual. Amen. Amen. They still have the yearning, but they're turned off by the hypocrisy by certain people who might be children of Jerry Falwell. And um, Frank and Jackie consistently remind us that Christ, who this religion is supposed to be about, should not be confused with his many unauthorized fundamentalist fan clubs. Uh, historically, white supremacists of both political parties have used Christianity to justify the slaughter of indigenous peoples, the labor exploitation of Africans, of Chinese workers. Uh, they've used the Bible to turn a blind eye to the suffering of European Jews and to the indefinite detention and torture of Muslims. Uh, they're also the people who call the Christian refugees at our southern border illegals. But consistently, liberal Christians have been the ones to stand up against what the fundamentalists have been doing from the very beginning of the Americas as we know it. When Columbus first came here and began brutally subjugating the people, which he did because he felt he was being such a good Christian, it was Father Bartolomeo de las Casas, the priest on his boat, who wrote a letter of protest back to the Queen over the atrocities Columbus was committing. It's, it's very important to remember the first act of protest against human rights abuses by a European in this hemisphere was a Catholic priest. And that tradition carries on through Martin Luther King, through Dorothy Day, through Bishop John Shelby Spahn, who we just lost, through Sister Helen Prejean. Reverend Jackie and Mr. Schaefer are people who carry on that tradition using this man, we all agree the religion is based on, to call the destructive hypocrites into the light. But I'm a comedian. I don't care about calling them into the light. It is my job to mock and humiliate them. <laughs> so I'm proud to say that I have had shows picketed by Westboro Baptist Church. Yes, that's better than a daytime Emmy. Um, I have debated Jerry Falwell Sr. and David Duke on the Bill Maher Show. I have been attacked on Twitter by Ted Cruz and Sarah Palin, and I have received multiple online death threats from self-proclaimed right-wing Christians, many of whom still have yet to master that tricky your, your distinction. And all of this has happened, brothers and sisters, because I have dared hold a very controversial, very radical spiritual point of view, which is that Jesus is not a dick. <laughs> That's it. Now, I had a very Catholic childhood. I had an extremely Catholic. I had a very Catholic childhood. My, my, we, we used to have open casket reunions in my family. Um, some of you may know my mother was a nun for 16 years before she was married, obviously. My mom came from the South. The convent put her through nursing school, and she went to Africa to work with lepers in the jungles of Malawi. My father was a Franciscan brother from Brooklyn 
He wore the brown robes and the rope belt, and he taught history to Catholic boys, and he walked amongst the people like the lost Jedi Knight of Flatbush. My father the brother met my mother the sister. <laughs> <laughs> fell madly in love, even though he had promised God he would never fall in love. Eventually, after ten years, he got her to leave the convent. They settled on the Isle of Long and tried to raise us to be progressive, free-thinking Catholics, which is why I do stand-up, because I can never afford the therapy I so deeply require. <laughs> so, I just want to say, like, I, I, I grew up admiring Jesus the way any guy admires mom's first husband, but... <laughs> I have come to believe, and I mean no disrespect to the faithful, but I have come to view Jesus in much the way I've come to view Elvis. I love the guy, but a lot of his fan clubs terrify me. And we live in a time when fundamentalist right-wing Christians control the narrative, and they believe in worshiping Jesus as a god, because that's a lot easier than following his extremely liberal teachings. We live in a time when politicians try to get the abortion rate to go down by making it harder for poor women to get access to birth control. We live at a time when bless your heart has become a euphemism for screw you. It has. I, I don't know how, but American Christians made bless your heart, fuck you, the same thing. We live at a time when American fundamentalist Christians believe a talking snake is absolute literal fact, but love your enemies that's just Jesus being all metaphorical and shit. Um, here, here, this is what I kind of do. Like, these people are the real deal. I'm a, I'm a vulgar vaudevillian. These people are the real deal, but this is the sort of thing I do. At your next family gathering, when you have Uncle Racist over in the corner in the red hat, uh, and he's talking about how uh, the talking snake is literal, uh, the God, Genesis is literal fact, you could do, you know, what I used to do and say, but... What does Genesis, what does the talking snake have to do with Christ? It's spiritually insignificant, but that's not going to get to him, so try this sometime. Um, ask him, well, if you believe in Genesis as literal fact, which version of Genesis? Because in Genesis chapter 1, God creates man and woman at the same time, but in Genesis chapter 2, he creates man first, and then could not find Adam a suitable mate. And by the way, let me tell you, as a child, that passage confused me very much. I mean, what were these ceremonies like? Who got the rose in the garden? I mean, what was Adam trying out as a mate? Ferrets and trees? I mean, it's, it's, you know, can you think about these things? So finally, God exhausted every other mammal and decided to create a mate and pulled Adam's rib while he slept and fashioned it into the first woman, which became Eve. So ask your fundamentalist loved one, which one do you believe? They can't both be true. Were they created together, man and woman? Or was man here first, and then woman came from his rib? And I guarantee you, nine times out of ten, your uncle racist will say, I believe that the man, man was here first, and then God took his rib and made the first woman. And that's when you say, oh, so what you're saying is, you believe the first ever woman transitioned from a man. <laughs> They might not invite you back, but they will not forget you. So in 2016, our conservative evangelical brothers and sisters elected a spray-tanned hybrid of Caligula, Barabbas, and the Golden Calf. The Christians gave us a serially lying, overtly racist, famously page six level adulterous, pro-torture, empathy-free, narcissistic mocker of the disabled who promised to bring back torture and turn away war refugees, whose entire campaign was launched by a vicious racist smear about the first black president, and whose campaign peaked with an audio taped confession of sexual assault. Donald Trump has now become Jesus to certain followers of Jesus who don't much care for the actual teachings of Jesus. And to wit, this is what we're up against. This is why I'm not surprised when Christianity has become an atheist factory in our society. Indiana passes the Religious Freedom Law, which essentially legalizes discrimination against LGBT taxpaying citizens, uh, delighting homophobic Christians who haven't realized that Christ was not a homophobe. The Hobby Lobby controversy, which we've seen, with, with, where, where they're de denying female employees birth control despite the fact the Bible is not against birth control. And it's not against birth control. God never says, thou shalt not wear a jimmy hat, okay? Um, 
When God said be fruitful and multiply, there were two people. We're about to hit eight billion. Mission accomplished, guys. Right-wing Christians are fighting to turn away the most desperate of Middle Eastern refugees, all while worshiping Christ, who, it can fairly be argued, was once a Middle Eastern refugee. Jerry Falwell Jr. Um, you know, I, his sex life's the most likable thing about him. And, um, he was the first prominent evangelical to get people to vote for Donald Trump, and now he's been sued for $10 million by Liberty University. The school founded by his father, Jerry Falwell Sr., advisor to multiple presidents, who was a segregationist, who built whites-only schools and supported apartheid. <laughs> This is what passes for Christianity in our culture. You watch TV and what do you see? Atheists and imbeciles. You see non-believers and then you see cretins screaming at women outside clinics. Those aren't the Christians I grew up around. But we all know nobody hates like a Christian who's just been told their hate isn't Christian. Now, we're, we're never gonna get there with hate. And Frank and Jackie have reminded me many times that we have to fight for these people. We can't hate them back. So to help you understand briefly, um, I would like to do my part to help everyone understand our right-wing Christian brothers and sisters. I, I brought along uh, a little list. These are the top ten commandments of right-wing Jesus. These are things you have to believe to be a right-wing Christian in America. Number ten, thou shalt pretend the Bible is against abortion. Right? It's accepted. Except y'all have read the book. You know, in Genesis, God says life begins with first breath. In Exodus, God makes it clear he assigns more value to a woman's life than a fetus. Uh, in uh, God one time uh, drowned every fetus on earth one day with a flood because he felt like it. Um, and if you really think that God is very against killing children, let me tell you, Gentile, about Passover. Um, God gives abortion tips for unfaithful pregnant wives in Numbers chapter 5. I'm not saying the Bible's pro-abortion. I'm saying that they've been suckered into prioritizing something Jesus never mentions over everything Jesus taught. America has become a place where followers of Jesus vote against everything Jesus ever talked about because of abortion, which Jesus never talked about. Jesus was against the death penalty, which leads to number nine, thou shalt ignore Jesus on the death penalty. Um, if you're a right-wing Christian, you already know, forgive us our trespasses as we lethally inject those who trespass against us. That's the racket. Jesus overturns eye for an eye in Sermon on the Mount. He says you have to forgive those who wrong you 70 times 7. He stops an execution and says only sinless people can carry them out. And by the way, you guys know, if there was no death penalty, Jesus might still be here. Number eight, thou shalt pretend Jesus hates immigrants as much as you. How did this happen? Why are our Christians protesting the refugees and not there on the border with blankets and water? like Christ would be. There's no laws about borders in the Bible. There's no laws about immigration in the Bible. These people they call illegals are people I call Christian refugees. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me, Matthew 25. And in Matthew 2, you know, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph all try to escape, and they hide out in Egypt, which means you can say our Lord and Savior grew up an undocumented teen. Um, number seven, thou shalt pretend Jesus hates LGBT people as much as you. You remember the 80s and 90s, right? I mean, this was the strongest thing they had. Now, Jesus never directly mentions gay people. He healed the centurion's slave. In Greek, it was pais, or beloved boy. That's a whole other lecture. But Jesus was pretty specific about treating others the way you'd like to be treated. Our fundamentalist friends go by Leviticus. The book of Leviticus, which says, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman. That is an abomination. It says nothing about Two guys standing up, one guy leaning against the men's room stall while the Republican senator plays lookout, just shall not lie with. And by the way, it's, it's not just hating gays. If you believe Leviticus, you have to stone them to death. And I don't know if you homophobes have noticed, the gay brothers have been working out. They're ready for you. Come at them. Go ahead. You see the 300? Those gay men were very ready. I came out to my parents after watching that movie. Um, you can't be a homophobe and be a Christian. It's really, really simple. Uh, oh, but if you really want to believe in Leviticus, you really want to believe Leviticus matters more than Jesus, then you've got to follow every law of Leviticus, which means you also have to have the death penalty for children who are gluttons or drunks. Bye-bye, Don Jr. Um, anybody who works on the Sabbath, that Saturday, so long NASCAR. Anyone who cuts their hair at the temples or tattoos the flesh. And I sure am going to miss the U.S. Marine Corps and half the bands I like. And adultery. Yes, Trump supporters, if you really believe the part of the Bible that says 
being gay is a sin, you also have to believe in the death penalty for adulterers, which means you must execute Donald Trump twice, which you should not do. Um, coincidentally, the Bible does have one passage against men with men, but nothing about women with women. And I find it a bit telling that the almighty and vivid video have the same exact policy. Um, <laughs> number six, thou shalt believe all that prosperity gospel garbage, right? Right? I mean, are, am I the only one sick of the prosperity gospel? I love preachers with good taste and hair gel, but come on. I mean, like, like <laughs> Jesus said pay your taxes. He said give away your money to the poor. He said it's really hard for rich people to get into heaven. He was obviously paid to be a crisis actor by George Soros. Uh, number five, thou shalt not let your tax dollars pay for some lazy person's health care. This is the era of prayer against care, where we see Christians fighting to make sure the least of us are not protected. All these hospitals have saints' names because that was Jesus' marching orders. In Matthew 25, the parable of the goats and the sheep, he says he will assemble the individuals and the nations and ask them, have you taken care of the poor, taken care of the sick, been kind to those in prison? It's right there. Israel has four different kinds of public options <laughs> and uh, free abortions. Just putting it out there. I mean, Obamacare is not a blueprint for socialism. You're thinking of the New Testament. Number four. <laughs> Number four is one of my favorites, uh, thou shalt bear false witness. If you are a follower of right-wing Jesus, you can lie all you want. Obama wasn't really born here. We, uh, Trump had the largest inaugural crowd of all time. Joe Biden stole the 2020 election. I mean, this is just the golden age of bearing false witness. And it's okay because I put up a Christmas tree in my house once a year, so I'm on God's side. Like, and, and we gotta call out our own side as well. And I'm fair about this. I will call out liberals who lie about our conservative brothers and sisters. Like when they say Donald Trump said to drink bleach. That's a vicious lie. And it's stupid. He never said that. He said inject disinfectant, okay? <laughs> Let's be honest, liberals. Don't, li don't lie about their lies. You don't need to. Um, number three, if you're a follower of right-wing Jesus, thou shalt crap on the marginalized. How do we get to this place? It, you, whatever you think of Jesus, actual historical figure, myth, a uh, prehistoric faith healer, first innocent brown-skinned man to get the death penalty, whatever you believe, divine son of God. In the book, he stands for one thing, the marginalized. Whoever is being beaten up on the hardest, that's who Jesus is fighting for. The lepers, the prostitutes, the poorest of the poor, the tax collectors, even the Roman centurion, despised by the Jews because his slave or pais, beloved boy, was sick at home and Jesus healed him. If you're a Trump-Pence Christian, it's the exact opposite. How can we disparage the marginalized? The desperate Christian refugees at our border, poor people on SNAP benefits, trans kids who want to use a bathroom they feel comfortable with, transgender soldiers who would like to serve a country despite the fact that it despises them. The, I mean, asylum seekers at our border. This is what right-wing Christianity has become. They're not just insane, they are no room at the insane. And number two, Thou shalt pretend America is a Christian nation. This is a big one of right-wing Jesus. Um, and I'll believe we're a Christian nation, you know, when we, I guess, when, when you see that we have to have people voting to help the poor and let private charities bail out Wall Street and fund our Pentagon budget. I, I like the people who say that the government has no responsibility to help the poor are the same ones who say we're a Christian nation. Ask a slave owner about that sometime. And finally, number one, um, the number one commandment of right-wing Jesus, thou shalt ignore everything the Bible Jesus actually taught. That's why I'm honored to be in a group like this. That's why I'm honored to speak to y'all to be in front of these two bodhisattvas of Christianity. I just made that up, but it's true. I mean, uh, you know, Jesus is someone who I vote for every year. For elections, I write in Jesus. I like to do it for president all the time. Uh, because think about it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great to vote for Jesus? Wouldn't your hardcore right-wing loved ones or that guy on Facebook you knew in high school who claims to be Christian, wouldn't they love to just get rid of the middleman and vote for Jesus? To vote for Jesus of Nazareth as president, a peaceful, radical, nonviolent revolutionary who hung around with lepers, hookers, and crooks, who never spoke English, was not an American citizen, was anti-capitalism, anti-wealth, completely anti-death penalty, never once anti-gay, never once mentioned abortion, never really technically condemned premarital sex, never called poor people lazy, never fought for tax cuts for the wealthiest Nazarenes, never asked a leper for a co-pay, never said, eh, torture's okay in some instances, 
and was a long-haired, brown-skinned, that's in Book of Revelation, bugger off left behind books, brown-skinned, homeless, community organizing, anti-slut-shaming, unarmed, Palestinian, liberal Jew. But of course, that's only if you believe what's actually in the Bible. And, you know, the Bible's a lot like the Mueller report. Uh, it's impossible to support Donald Trump if you've read the second half of it. <laughs> I'm not afraid of people who hijack airplanes. I'm afraid of the people who hijack my parents' faith. I'm afraid of the people who hijack religion. Christianity was supposed to be a sanctuary city. And by the way, the only thing Donald Trump and Jesus have in common, they both hung out with hookers, and they both used ghostwriters. That's it. I mean, that's all I've had, right, Reverend? I mean, at a time when Christianity is becoming synonymous with hatred of immigrants, denial of science, indifference to the suffering of the poor, contempt for women, rejecting those in need, it's more important than ever to have events like this, to support events like this, and remind the Christians that these positions aren't Christian. We have to, with love, take away their rubbish claims of piety. I'm tired of them speaking for a movement based on love and compassion. Christianity is the sanctuary city. It's supposed to be about love. And this struggle against the forces of hypocrisy and meanness will not be fought and won by politicians. It will be done by ordinary people like y'all, and it's gonna be done at their jobs, over the family dinner table, and yes, over social media. It sucks not being able to hate them back, but we don't get to hate them back. My father was, before he died, he, he, he said something I never forgot. He said to me, my father, the brother, he said, there's two things God can't do. He can't stop loving you, and he can't stop forgiving you. That's my religion. And I, well, I don't claim to be a great Christian, okay? The only thing I have in common with Jesus is neither one of us would ever put our hair in a man bun. I promise you. I, but, but I'm tired of seeing this faith of love used to justify meanness and selfishness and greed. And while I fall short, I have tried to walk that line and to fight the Christian hypocrites, not with hate and anger, but with humor and actual stuff Jesus said. So I'm deeply honored and humbled to be here amongst all of you and amongst these two people, because here's the deal. If you're going to fight hate, if you're really going to fight hate, don't whine if you get a little on you. Just wash it off before it sticks. But thank you so much for being here. Yeah.